I am co-past president of the Nebraska Art Teachers Association, and I am joined with Hillary George, who is our exhibitions chair for the Nebraska Juried um, Exhibition for NATA. And I will introduce her and let her kick it, let her kick it off for us tonight. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'm so glad that everybody was able to be here. Um, and oh, hi, Liz. I, I see that you're on. Yay. Okay. Um, so we have our three award winners from the NADA jury to exhibition um, that took place during our fall conference. And um, our first place winner was Liz Langdon. Um, and I will show the slides of all the artwork after I kind of introduce everybody. Um, her second place winner was Jody Boyer. And our third place winner was Deborah, Deborah Kipley. Um, and so thank you so much for being here. Um, and we're really excited to kind of hear a little bit about, you know, your art making and your process and everything um, that goes along with it. So let me um, pull up those slides and I'll, I'll give you kind of our... Um, I'll give you kind of our first little talking point that we're going to start off with is having each artist talk about their piece entered in the show. So once I get um, that, once I get that slide up, hopefully I don't have any issues with sharing my screen here. Okay, share. I'm just gonna share my whole screen. So don't like judge all of the things that I have open and all the icons I have on my desktop if you happen to see them. <laughs> okay, so we will start here. Is it? Okay, why can't I find my little presentation mode? Uh, I believe, yeah, there you go. Down just a little. Or... Oh, it's covered there. It, it's covered by my by my icons. Oh. There we go, sorry about that. I was like, why can't I see it? Okay, so first up um, we have Liz Langdon, Life and Death Cycle, number three and the, oh. My icons are still covering. Okay. And the medium here is found ceramic turkey bone wire, crown of thorns plant. Mm -hmm. Hi, so did you want me to talk about it now? Yeah, whatever you want to share about your artwork, we would love mm -hmm. to hear. Um, we, uh, we have a few more questions too. Um, if you don't have, you know, if you want a minute or two to think. Um. No, I mean, I can talk about this. Sure. Um, I can always use more time to think, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to think <laughs> about, but I can tell you about these. Um, so, and I did, I reviewed, um, is his name, Stefan Gro, the uh, um, jurors yep. comments. Yeah, so I reviewed those because, um, well, I was certainly totally surprised that I was chosen as the best of show. That was very amazing because I just, I really just entered because, you know, I don't live in Nebraska anymore, but so many of my friends are in Nebraska. I just thought it'd be nice to share artwork and just contribute to the cause of the N NATA, not thinking I would benefit from it. So thank you very much. Um, and what was interesting was that I did this, this, this series, there's, I did like 12 of these all with they're, um, they're all found ceramic pieces, which means I went to the KU ceramic shop at the end of the semester and I just collect everything that the students leave behind. And then I have it to work with. Cause you know, I, I do, and it says right there, it's found ceramic. So it was, it was funny to me that Stefan went back to his, uh, to the Kaneko in clay because it is, I'm a clay artist. So I don't have any qualms about just recycling ceramics that I found because I, I mean, it's not like I can't make these things, but these things are already made and they're going into a dumpster. It's terrible. And they were all bisque fired. Okay. 
So, so really my knowledge of ceramics is always at work. So it's like, well, these are bisque fired. So they would make good things to grow things in because they're not vitreous. The water can, you know, naturally flow in and out of the walls. So these guys won't get waterlogged. So, and, and I'm also, and I'm, and at the same time, I'm recycling this crown of thorn plants, which just continues to produce these terrible thorny vines, but they have this great flower. So I cut them and root them and cut them and root them. And well, and then there's the bones. So I met, I think this summer with everybody and um, with, you know, Bob and, um, and Jody and you guys who were there know, I just joined in at one of your meetings sharing art um, ideas. And I shared the fact that I had collected all these turkey bones and that I didn't know what I was going to do with them because they really weren't going to work out as ceramic mosaic pieces. But it got me thinking about how could I use them? So I just integrated them in, as part of the ceramic form because really bones are basically alumina and silica also and calcium. So they're all kind of related materials. So, um, but I broke all my rules because I, I, I was a very traditional ceramicist. Everything has to be fired and glazed, whatever. And these are actually just spray painted. And I just, I, I was not going to glue the bones on because I know that water and glue, it will break apart and it won't last. But I kind of just got over that idea of how everything had to be so permanent. So I glued the bones on and spray painted these and just put them together and um, a juror liked them. So that was nice, but I, I like them too. Um, but it's also fun to see how some of them have weathered in the snow and vines are dead and everything. And it kind of emphasizes the whole life and death cycle. So anyway, I don't have a lot of time to make art. So this summer I really did have time and it was wonderful to have time and just kind of suffer in the heat of my studio and just make things. So um, I made about 12 of these. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out how I can just wire the bones on. The bones are like legs. I have images of the rest of these somewhere, but anyway, um, I don't know if that really, you know, but it, I, I always believe that materials and the artists, when they come together, you know, the art happens. So um, you don't, I don't, and, and if it's strong, it, like, I don't have to say too much, but the story of how I was inspired to do this, I thought was really interesting because it really did come from a, a NATA meeting, just talking about eh, trying to make art. So anyway, that's all I've got for now. Well, thanks. thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I really um, enjoyed it since I since I was the one taking in all of the um, mm -hmm. the applications and the um, I was able to see like you know your the series that you submitted all three of them and I was a big fan of this work as well. Oh, so thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you. Well, someday uh, if if you guys do it in the fall for real, I will bring one up for the auction. But, awesome. Yeah. That would be awesome. Okay. And next we have Jody Boyer, chamomile still life, medium photography, chamomile ice. Jody, would you like to say a few, a little bit about your um, piece of artwork here? Yeah, sorry, my internet just crashed and reconnected. <laughs> it's all the tech issues these days, so. <laughs> we, yeah, we've had a lot up in our neighborhood with the phone. We've had to have our phone line fixed four times in the last six oh, weeks, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm actually going to read a statement because that keeps me on point and it will help me um, give context to this piece. So um, this is one of the early pieces of a new body of work I've been working on since April of 2020. And the body of work started at the beginning of the pandemic. While I sheltered in place with my family, I found myself reflecting not only on self-care, but also on the roles and responsibilities of how we tend to each other, our shared communities, and our shared humanity. 
In my kitchen, while I prepared food for my family, I began to explore creating ephemeral sculptural objects. As artists, we can problem solve and remain creative even in times of crisis with little to nothing on hand. The science of ice, food coloring, and my freezer became my artistic tools and my kitchen a photo studio. I used decaying leftovers from flower bouquets bought to brighten our domestic space. My children and I also began foraging in our neighborhood as a way of thinking about place and sustainability. This is new work for me, but is tied to my identity as artist, researcher, mother, teacher. The work investigates domesticity, a word that's hard for me to say, and physical change on a metaphoric and visceral level. Decorative glass designed for celebration, a world frozen, loss, the fleeting existence of fragile cut flowers, grief, and the passing of time are all embedded in the eye candy of these sculptural still life photographs. Thank so you. that's a statement that I wrote a couple months ago to kind of frame this body of work that has continued since this early piece. This was one of the first pieces that I was really satisfied with in my experimentations. And um, I was really honored to have it recognized by NATA and our juried exhibition. Awesome, congratulations. Yes, thank you, Hillary. And thank you for sharing. And I also have to thank you for sharing all of your work every day because it inspires me. Thank you. I love seeing all the pictures. And then um, our third place winner was Deborah Kipley. Um, and the title is Honoring Women Who Serve, Medium Steel and Acrylic. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so um, I've had a real love hate relationship with this piece since um, the beginning of it. This was to commemorate Papillion's 150th anniversary, which was 2020. As you can imagine, many of the um, things we had planned to celebrate it were canceled, or some may be postponed to this summer, we'll see. And um, I thought maybe I would do one of them, but this is not the one I would have thought I was gonna do because I would have done one that had art, music and theater on it and represent my organization. But the women's group I belong to asked me to do this one and they wanted it at Veterans Park in Papillion, no pressure there. Um, and they want it to be honoring women who serve. So um, when I did the mock-up of it, I basically went to them and said, okay, so here is my design. Um, kind of a take it or leave it. It's like, this is it. I'm not going to have, and, and I mean, this is a lot of, you know, a lot of the women are 70 plus in the group. Um, it's like, um, if you want to nitpick or you don't like the design, I am really okay if you find somebody else to do this for you. So it arrived at my house in January, this 250 pound butterfly. Fortunately, um, it fit in my house and I didn't have to have it in my garage and be painting on the floor. And I immediately called Paula Yoakum and said, okay, Paula, how do you paint big metal things? So she um, gave me some advice and I painted it all white and um, I really did not seriously start on it until last March, so almost a year ago. Um, and it was in this like maybe 10, Oh, less than 10 foot by 10 foot space in my downstairs. So, I mean, you know, like a sculpture that's going to be viewed from all sides, walking away from it and looking at it was not possible. There was a problem of um, taking it from my tiny little mock up to this big, huge 250 pound sculpture and everything. And I'm, I'm a make art on demand as opposed to constantly making art. But, um, once it was finally finished and the woman who had um, paid for it from the group was pleased with it, um, fortunately. And once it got placed, I was like so pleasantly surprised at um, all the happy accidents. Um, for instance, I mean, it's just an ultramarine blue, but it is in our veterans park. And the blue that I used matches the monuments where the veterans names are. So that was cool. But the other happy accident of it was that when I was out there and I looked at it from all four sides, I was really pleased with the fact that from 
any angle that you look at it is, it's pleasing to look at, you know, mine's much simpler than a lot of the other ones. But like I say, probably my first and last um, piece of public art. But um, like I say, I am thrilled to be in the company of Liz and Jody and um, there you go. And Liz, I'm at Anna's house and I asked if she knew who she was and she went through her mind, all of our connections. And <laughs> there are many. There are. Well, thank you, Debbie. Um, and I, it's so exciting that this is out in the public for everybody to kind of go and enjoy. So, well, and the yeah. other, the other really cool thing about it was, is that um, we put, um, cause my husband was um, a Vietnam era vet his name is on one of the walls. So you can see my bench from his name and you can see the wall that his name is on from my bench. So That's really as long cool. as it lasts, you know, maybe someday grandchildren will go and say, oh, look, there's grandma and grandpa. We haven't met grandpa, can't meet grandpa, but it's all good. Yeah, sweet. That is really sweet connection. So thank you for sharing um, about your work. So, um, all three of you women are in interesting positions where you're teaching in the classroom, teaching at a university, and then also retired, but supervising future teachers. And so how do you find the balance between <laughs> your practice and the educating future leaders? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On top of your daily life, personal life. <laughs> I, I don't know what normal is. I swear it's ever, it's been well over, it's been a year since COVID and the breaking of the bones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my sister who raises the turkey, she broke her bones. Then two weeks later, I broke my bones. And so it's been a year <laughs> and there have been births in my family that bring me to St. Louis. So I'm in St. Louis right now. I traverse the state almost every week. <laughs> um, so really that work this summer, it kind of has to tide me over till this coming summer because this is just, um, I've been loaded down with more teaching responsibilities with a, so I don't, I, to be honest, I, I just, I just have to wait till the summer. Yeah. I'm just waiting till the summer. Yeah. 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 Cause there's a lot of other stuff that I, I have to do. So, but I guess it's just, you know, it's, it's not the month to month. It's, it's more like the year to year or the decade to decade, you know, once you plant your fork and you go, oh, no, damn it. I think I am an artist. I think I can, I think I can do this, figure it out, you know, and if you just keep doing that, you know, randomly you win a show, you know, there's always, there's always some little thing that dangles and goes, no, you should keep doing this. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, this is great. And then, you know, everything else, just the big tidal waves come over and it's like, oh, well, to wait for that for that tide to be really low again and then I can see <laughs> I can see the parts of my life there it's like oh yeah here's one here's one that's sustaining so I don't know if that makes sense but mm -hmm. but I think it's important like like I said even if it's a decade the decade but you know keep making you're an artist just keep mm -hmm. keep yeah and accept the fact your art's going to change and you know and that rules are arbitrary as to what is good and bad and it doesn't matter you yeah. yeah it's the pursuit so that's what i'd say i find that it's really helpful to look at the practice a bit like exercise or taking your vitamins and so you know i get up every morning and um yeah. force myself out of bed at five to meet my swim partner and do that five days a week. And for the last six months, I've been doing the same, forcing myself to make the space for that artistic practice. Um, and sometimes it's just a drill, you know, it's just an exercise like, like a flutter kick or 
but focusing on the flip turn. And sometimes there's something really productive that comes out of it. Um, but I have to make the space um, in my life. And I think I've learned over the last, especially in the pandemic, I've learned what keeps me sane and what keeps me healthy. Um, and so, you know, I can't do the work of teaching during the day if I'm not feeding my artistic soul. And Josie and I've talked about this a bit before, you know, I came to this work because I'm an artist first and a teacher second. And I don't have any problem saying that, you know, I do this work because my artistic practice needs an income to be okay. And when I went into K-12 teaching 10 years ago, it was so that I could have a full-time job that had a teacher's union that would support me and my family, but I also could have my studio be supported. And so, you know, I, I make that the primacy of what I do and I'm, I'm emotionally and intellectually okay with that. You know, um, and I think it's hard for art teachers to do that because we give so much and we're so caring for our students that sometimes I think we feel bad um, saying that it's okay to put ourselves first in, in any way. Um, and I think that the pandemic has helped me understand how important that is because our time here is fleeting, you know, and if you're in the Judeo-Christian mindset, it's a one-way trip, right? So you want, you want to use your time as effectively as you can. And I, and then I'm a better person for my students. Um, when I do take care of myself in this way. Um, so that's, that's how I do it for me. Um, I, I don't know if that would work for everyone, but that that's what works for me. So I am clearly a teacher first and artist second, which is what makes me smile to see um, Mr. Reeker making art because I think he's kind of in that category too. Um, and um, I have been revitalized this semester. I don't know how my, it got down to me um, of retired people to super, at, be asked to supervise students, teachers for UNO but it's been revitalizing and um, it's a bucket list item I never thought I would be able to check off. So it's been a great pleasure to be able to do that. Um, but I, you know, teaching elementary art for 29 years and making six to seven messes a day and cleaning them up and then coming home and raising a child um, um, and all of her activities, um, it was really hard to make space or to make my own mess you know, from that standpoint during that time. And I've always been um, a jack of many trades and a master of none. And I feel like right now I'm kind of embracing that. Um, two times a year, um, I produce um, a play, our winter play is a dramatic play, our summer play is a musical with um, elementary and middle school kids. And we did arts camp last summer we got kids ready to go back to school um, and how to wear masks. And right now we have 33 kids in our winter play. Um, and so, and our parents have been so thrilled that, you know, um, we didn't cancel. And I do the costuming for that. And I've really, there are times where all the kids are on stage and I look at the costuming because I think about, you know, okay, what colors do I want to represent this class of characters and what colors do I want to represent this characters or what colors and, and style do I want to represent the theme of the play and what do we have in our 20 year stockpile that I can rework and put together. And um, I'm sure nobody else notices it, but I sometimes sit back and thought, this is really visually good. I did a good job of putting this together. And I feel like, um, and, and I feel like that's a work of art. Um, and I, um, the last, Oh, number of years, I've had a couple of flute students, one of which was amazingly gifted. I mean, he had played everything I'd played in, through college by the time he was a sophomore in high school. But um, a couple of days ago, um, my daughter and I were going through some cassette tapes and my flute recital from Hastings College from 1978 was in the cassette player. And we played it and it was like, huh. I, I don't mind listening to it, it still holds up. But then there was also the realization that, but you know what, I've not had a lesson since 1978, but I play better now than I did then. 
you know, so it's kind of in my retirement years. Um, I joined Medicare on April 1st um, of embracing of embracing the um, jack of all trades and realizing all of that, you know, whether it's the flute, whether it's, you know, creating the costumes and the occasional work of art, that all of that's okay and all that's a part of the creative process. Yeah, thank you for sharing um, those pieces. I know it's like, I, I hear what you're like, I can relate, I personally, not to make it about me, but I can feel that like, ah, uh, you have to take care of yourself. And if you're creative, that's the outlet. Like you have to feed that before you can go to others and you have to, but part of it is showing up and doing the work too, you know? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for sharing. Um, let's see here. So the next question that we have for you is what inspires you? Where do you get your creative inspiration from? Um, I guess if we're going in order, I'll just pop in. <laughs> so. There's no rules here, so. <laughs> and I can answer that one. So yeah, I guess I'm you know, I've just always worked in clay and ceramics. So I just, that's just where I stay. Um, I mean, I work with, I like to make cards for people and things, but, um, which is also a, a fun and creative outlet. But when I want to make something that gives me time to think through ideas, I just work, I just always work with ceramics. So, because I, and, you know, form, you know, like, like, just like forms talk and the clay and talks. And I don't know, it's just like, that's what I'm familiar with. But the idea of it not having to be all finished. And um, I don't know, this idea of being able to make digital creations that are transient. So my pieces are kind of transient. Um, Jody's are very transient. And I'm thinking, yeah, well, these kind of are too. So, um, so I'm, you know, kind of pushing that. I'm pushing that boundary for myself a little bit. So um, I guess that's it. You know, the, the facts of knowing your materials and then pushing the boundaries. I think those are those are probably good guiding uh, practices that certainly are good. That I mean, I don't think about teaching now. I mean, yeah. I, Think that's what I would tell my students but um anyway yeah that's what I'm doing it's interesting to think about clay being sorry to interrupt transient because it's like I know in art history like you learn about how clay lasts for so long and it's passed on for yeah 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 history. yeah and that's how I I was certainly yeah, that's how I was like raised up in that tradition like with Henry Henry Serenko very traditional ceramicist you know and you know skeptical of anything that wasn't you know gas fired and fired and stuff and so yeah but then breaking ceramics and ceramic chards I mean the material stays around in whatever form it is but you sure can change the form by breaking it or you know that's why I like to I did the mosaic workshop and I know Laura Laura did a great piece in it. Laura Huntemeyer, if you're still here, it was a great piece. Um, so yeah, and then like you just to take all this crazy stuff that's been made in ceramic materials and break it apart and recontextualize it. Oh, it's so much fun. So I, I have a bit of a sense of humor and I just love to do that. But what I really love is to see what other people do. It's a very freeing process. So that's what I will do when I retire from teaching, which won't be too much longer. So I'm just going to do those workshops. So yeah, I've done a lot of those workshops and that's what I really like to do. It's very, it's like anybody can do it and everybody feels good about it when they're done, I think. So I shall mute myself now. Debbie, are we going in order? I don't know. 
Um, I think I'd say life, concerts, music uh, are inspiring um, in that regard. I have some paintings in my head I want to do right now. I just have to get myself down there to get the drawing on canvas and do it. Um, but I, I think one thing I can say is that back, you know, back when Broadway was alive, to sit in um, one of those Broadway theaters and have the musical come on, you know, whether it was Jersey Boys or Wicked that I've seen way too many times and everything. And just that overwhelming um, feeling of here I am in the midst of um, the arts being made. And I get that same feeling um, for our summer arts camp when we have our big production, everybody's singing and dancing number. And it's as aesthetic, it's as an aesthetic experience to see that those kids are on stage doing it as it is to participate in watching it on Broadway. So I would say, you know, life, other people's arts, music, are things. I would echo both of you in terms of life and the everyday. Um, I think materiality has a lot to do with how I function as an artist. Um, a lot of the work that I'm making right now is made with objects that I buy at thrift stores. And I grew up having a grandmother who had a antique store in Selwood called Pandora's Box. She would take me to thrift stores and she would teach me at five, six, seven years old, how to walk up and down an aisle and find the fabrics that were worth money. Don't even look at the fabrics, touch them. And um, she had this great story where um, she found an 800 BC urn at an as is, which is a Goodwill where you buy things by the pound. And um, so she found this urn. She only had an eighth grade education because in the Great Depression, she had to leave high school and find a husband. Um, and she, she took this urn to the Portland art. We all thought she was, you know, full of it. And she opened her art history books and said, no, I, I found this urn. And she took it to the Portland Art Museum. And she, lo and behold, had found an 800 BC urn for 50 cents. And she had that thing up on her man, mantle. So, you know, she had a huge impact on me that I've only really begun to understand in the last five or six years since her death, really reflecting on some early experiences with her. And she just you know, really taught me about looking around at the world and the materiality of the world. Um, that combined with, I, you know, I have this deep love of science and I, I thought I was going to be a scientist. Um, so observing the world, understanding how the world works. And then when my dad got cancer, you know, science wasn't really a thing for me anymore because it just, it, it couldn't fix anything anymore. Um, and then I found this love of photography. So I think looking and observing is a huge part of my practice. And then reading, I love to read things. Um, I'm constantly reading um, and looking at other people's work, you know? And then just the experience of, of you know, being a mother, um, raising children is really informative to who I am as a person. I don't really talk much about it, um, but it is a huge part of my identity and it feeds my work really deeply. So. I didn't realize that you, your grand, Jody, your grandmother, did you say owned an antique store? Yeah, she did. She owned an antique store in the early eighties. Um, it ended up going under. Um, and then she was kind of destitute for a while. And then she spent the remainder of her life making arts and crafts and selling them at bizarre little hole in the wall flea markets. And so interesting. And were you a, were you a, if I may ask, like a child or teenage, like when all of this was? Um, yeah. So as you guys know, if you don't be personally, my parents had a pretty tumultuous relationship. And so in those periods of time, I sometimes would be taken care of for a while by my grandmother or she became kind of a caretaker to help my mom. So uh, she, she helped my mom take care of me from the time I was born until I was about six. Then we left 
Oregon for a couple of years. And then we went back to Oregon when I was about eight. Um, so before we left Oregon, I mean, I must have been four, five, six years old. She'd make me crawl around at the as is and find stuff. Go find that. Go get that. Go get that thing over there. She well, she was horribly mean too. She would beat me with a wooden spoon. Oh, she sorry. believed she believed in really old school punishment. Um, but she yeah she was very entrepreneurial. Um, she hmm. was very artistic. There's a lot there that I've I've really kind of dug and de- digging into trying to figure out some of these connections that you forget about right. Um, yeah. And then, you know, when you go through processes of grief or loss, you start to really remember things that you didn't remember, you know. That's interesting. Um, So thinking about, you know, like, I think sometimes, personally, some people, you know, it's like, oh, artist, educator, like separate these like professions, but like, it's pretty hard to do that. You know, like we all, you all live in an education world and an artistic world. So like, or maybe not, maybe that's like, maybe you don't see it that way. I I certainly don't want to speak for your, your ideas, but like, how do you like the artistic component? Like, do you find that it influences your role as an educator? Like, does it come into your classroom? Does it come in with the students that you work with or vice versa? What do you think? It, it does. It, even when I, when I taught high school, it, it did to some degree, although it was hard to relate what my research interests were to my high school students because it was a very process oriented clay class. And, but, um, but now that I teach, um, I teach, I teach college students. Some of them are artists, educators, and others are just they're just educators trying to learn about art. But um, I, I can speak much more confidently about art concepts just because I've kind of lived, lived the life. So, but I, I think our students. I mean, even when I taught high school, I mean they, they knew because they knew that it was important to me. I mean, just as artists, you know, how what we see as important is so different from what their other teachers or what might happen in their family. So I think that it is important, you know, that it's something that you pursue, however you do pursue it, not saying there's any one right way to, to pursue, but I think it's really vastly important that's that comes through to your students because we're we're a whole different lot than most of their teachers we are (laughs) you know it (laughs) so we have to celebrate that difference Uh true yeah i think it also is the role that you're playing so like for my university students where I'm teaching studio art, I share a lot because they have chosen that path and they're developing that voice. But for my middle school students, I'm more creating a space for them to go through adolescence and develop holistically. And so sometimes I share just a little bit, but most of the time, the role I'm playing isn't the role that I play in my studio as an or as an artist, right? And so I'm serving them differently. Um, so, you know, I, th- I think it ebbs and flows for me. Um, it also might be my working class background where I'm sort of like, I work all day so that I can have this other thing later on. Um, and I, f- I, you know, I love my daytime job and I love my work. I love working with young people. Um, but I don't feel also like they should have a responsibility to even understand me as an artist. I'm not being paid to be an artist. I'm being paid to be an art educator for them. Um, and so feeds my soul, but I don't, I don't know if I always, I need them to understand that part of my identity, if that makes sense. Um, Now my art club students, they want to know because they, they want to, they see themselves as wanting to become artists, right? 
So I think it's complicated. At least for me, it's complicated. Um, I think because I've traveled a, quite a bit and I'm so eclectic that when I was teaching elementary art, I brought in like things from places I'd been um, or, you know, used theater and, um, you know, folk, a la the Rose as education that Liz and our da my daughter got um, bringing in um, plays and stuff and, and, and having them dramatize folk tales from other cultures and that type of thing. I have some lovely drawings that um, I've now got, I've now let go of the actual drawing, but I did take pictures of them of a time when I went in, took my flute, sit at my music stand and had them draw me. And I have some wonderful drawings um, by like sixth graders of me playing the flute. Um, one of them looks, you know, my hair is everywhere. I look like a mad scientist, but I mean, they're just, they're just really sweet. Um, and um, um, Omaha South is one of the places where I have a student teacher and um, not the teacher she's um, assigned to, but the next teacher came in and says, oh, so who is your um, supervisor from UNO? And it's like, oh, Debbie Kipley. And she goes, Dr. Kipley, she was my first grade art teacher. You know, and she related that she remembered that I'd share things from um, one of my trips to Africa with her. So, I mean, it was just that was just a reinforcement of, you know, those things were important that you brought in from other places from your life. And and there she is, somebody who is an art teacher. That's really wonderful. Um, yeah, I I love hearing. Um, just how how educators and artists how you how you manage to balance everything and um, I draw inspiration from that myself and let's see here our next question that we have is are you working on any upcoming projects you have anything in the works right now I don't I've been I, I did I did I did get acquire an, an award for uh, the NAEA. I'm the chairperson of the lifelong learning group. So I just have to share this. So I went to the hot shops because it's we're giving an award for the first time. It's called the Pearl Greenberg Award for teaching and research in lifelong learning. Anyway, so but it's the first time. So we had to get an award. So I thought, well, what should we give? So anyway, I went to the hot shops, you know, and they have this gorgeous glass sculpture made by Frank DeHarsh that we're going to be giving out. But anyway, um, yeah, I'm doing committee work for a lot of committee work right now for that. <clears throat> Plus, I'm way overburdened with teaching four classes. So I just want to get through this semester, then life will be better. So no, I don't plan that way. I'll probably go up to the ceramic shop and see what they're throwing out in the May, in May. That's what I will do. And then, it, well, actually, and then I build, so my gardens, then I use ceramics in my garden. So, yeah, so it's kind of this summer growth thing is what I'm doing. That's my plan. I, I can't quite see through 2020. It just doesn't seem to have ended yet. I don't know if anybody else is feeling that way, but I, I think everybody is feeling that way. <laughs> oh, besides when, when the Chiefs lost, you know, when they went so flat, it's like, oh, this is really maybe it's over now because it really didn't start till anyway, it's not good. So we'll look forward to summer. Yay. That's my thinking. Yeah, maybe okay. then it'll be 2021. <laughs> Maybe then it will be 2021. It'll start in June. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to. I actually have like four paintings in mind that I want to do. Um, one is from um, a Christian group that I just love called For King and Country. And their last album was Burn the Ships. And basically it's talking about the, the imagery is of um, a captain who was on a ship 
and they went to a new land and the crew was like, okay, I don't think we want to go and everything. And um, the moral of the story is like, no, we're going and we're burning the ship behind us because we got to leave what's behind and move forward. And that's just been a really great metaphor for me. So I need, I need to do a painting on that. But the other thing is I want to do, um, I have three canvases to do um, an elephant, um, a giraffe and a zebra from pictures I've taken in Africa for my daughter and son-in-law because we have that joint experience, but also because um, my son-in-law's mother is a psychiatrist, um, but she also is a painter of, of sorts. And so she has her paintings in the house and they go, oh, Anna, your mom's an art teacher, is that her work? So they need some of my work in their house. <laughs> I have kind of a funny story that that um, give more information than I do on social media, but um, so I'm going to be exhibiting in the Sioux City Art Center selects this summer and fall, um, and they select eight artists from a 300 mile region. And what's really wonderful about this is that um, I have tried for 16 years to get in this exhibition. And in 2004, my introverted, amazing spouse um, did not want to send his artwork. And I forced him to send his artwork to the exhibition and he won best in show. And so since then, I've been sending my work and every time I get rejected, right? So in December, I whipped together my fifth submission, you know, and my spouse is teasing me from the couch. Oh, you're going to do it again, huh? Like I can't, I can't stop the punishment right and I was just like yes I am because I'm not going to give up that's that's the Joe Boyer in me I'm not going to give up and it was just really nice when I finally um, was accepted and had my this new body of work accepted I think it just speaks to what um, I, I try to share with my students you know earlier we had talked a little bit about what do we share with our students and I think I th what I share most with my students about being an artist is perseverance right and keeping at it um, today we were learning to make paint with markers because um, we all have our own set we can't share we can't touch anything and it's just a hot mess and you know we talked a lot I talked a lot about patience and risk taking and keeping at it so I bring that to my classroom from my practice um, and I'm I'm pretty excited to share uh, to share that I that I got in this show with other people who are artist educators because I think sometimes we do feel defeat trying to balance it all. So this is just a story of of a little insight into my little personal win, and I have been gloating around the house quite a bit. Let me tell you, <laughs> as you should. Yes. Good for so, you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Cool. So um, before we uh, wrap up our evening, um, are there any questions for our um, panelists of artists, Laura or Marilyn? Do you have any questions or Bob? Or do you have questions for each other? Hmm. I have a specific one for Jody, but I don't know if it's too intrusive on an artistic process, but I'm always... I've been watching a lot of the things that you post. And I think what sort of intrigues me is how you know um, when you want to take the photograph, like how far in the melting process has gone, because it seems to be at a similar point with some, what I've, I've observed. So my question is, do you force the melting at all? Or are you letting it net, net, melt naturally? And have you done a series of every so often taking a photograph to watch the change or um, anyway, that's, that's what I've been thinking about when I look at yours and how I hope you believe in um, imitations, the serious form of flattery. Cause I would, I'm just, I'm jealous. Cause I would love to do that. Freeze things. I don't have the freezer space, although I should be taking advantage of the, the weather. So anyway, that's my question that's been on my mind. Um. So I, I set up in my kitchen and on a Saturday, I start making things on a Monday and I, take, I took over our, one of our freezers. Um, and then when I shoot the images, 
when I first started, I was shooting six to 700 images of each sculpture. And at, I thought I was gonna do kind of a narrative, a time-lapse. And then I realized that I was really interested in a singular moment and how that would capture um, the, the transients in a different way. Cause the work is about a lot of things for me. It's about, it's about climate change. It's about the pandemic. It's about motherhood. It's about aging. It's about what's happening to my body. It's about lots of different stuff. So it's just a moment where I can capture and freeze time. Um, now that I'm getting a process down, I, um, will shoot probably about 200 of each piece. Um, and I'm starting to realize the moments that I like the most. And I do force the freezing and I have some magic tricks I don't reveal. Um, and then I sw I'll switch them out now because I'm trying to become much more efficient. Um, I have a personal goal of posting artwork every day, Monday through Friday for the whole year, just internally, because where, where I just where I want to be, I feel like time is going away from me quickly. So I want to use my time. Um, but yeah, it's a it's 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 a lot of waiting. And then a lot, and then a lot of just shooting, focus, shooting, focus, shooting. Um, and then when I go back and reflect, I'm going through and I'm just looking for that composition, you know, and I do a lot of cropping and a little bit of, you know, dodging, brewing and color manipulation, all that stuff to kind of make the theater. It's really theater, you know, there's a theater to it. Um, so that's the process so far. Um, I'm, I'm working on some other things. Um, I'm building molds right now um, and failing a lot at <laughs> building molds because a lot of my molds are um, leftover food packaging right now. Um, but now I'm trying to construct my own molds so I can make my own shapes. And a lot of failure. <laughs> well, the, the circular globe ones have been just lovely and you kind of push us with some that I find nice, perfectly balanced, and some have that tension of not being balanced in my in my eye. So, yeah, yeah, you know, it, I, I'm a, yeah. I obviously you might not always get a like on the unbalanced ones because that's just like I, I love it though. So anyway, thank you for and thank you for sharing your kitchen setup because I was I was like, how is she doing? That? How do you? I'm driving everyone nuts. <laughs> I might get a bigger house if I keep making this work because <laughs> like we we looked at, we were looking at houses at Omaha. We're thinking about moving and there was one with two kitchens and everyone was like, that's what we need. So we can eat because <laughs> we can't eat when you're in the kitchen I have a very small little kitchen in my house. And, but yes. Awesome. Um, if there are no more questions, we're going to wrap up our evening. Um, and we just want to thank everyone for being here. A couple of special thanks. Um, thanks to our panelists for joining us and sharing all of your creativity and your secrets and your um, educator practice and your artistic practice and all that knowledge um, that you've spent lots of time building to get to this point. And um, thanks, Hillary for hopping or for being a part of this session um, and all your work for the um, Nebraska Educator Show because there is a lot that goes into that on the other end and you do an amazing, amazing job. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and thanks Bob for helping on these sessions. It's always wonderful and thanks for running the behind the scenes. And Jody, it's so strange you're on the other side not on this side, asking all the questions because Jody um, is the founder of this whole conversations camaraderie. So yeah, till next time. <laughs> and uh, thank you all so much for uh, being a part um, of this of this session tonight. And we, our next one will be in March the 26th, Jody? Um, it's March 16th. 16th. I knew there was a um, 7 to 8 p.m. and we'll get some stuff out about the next one, probably in the next two days. And it will be about social emotional learning and arts education with Jennifer Warren, who I think might be the art educator of the year for Illinois this year. I think, I saw her picture in Western region. 
Bob's frozen or I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look and see. But I'm just she's to it through. Say the name again, Jody. I'm sorry. Je Jennifer. Oh, my brain is possibly having a brain fart. I think Jennifer Warren. That sounds um, familiar. She spoke at the National Art Education Leadership Conference last summer and she shared about social emotional learning and arts education. And she was just an absolute treasure and phenomenal resource. And so she's going to come and share with us. Um, her expertise and knowledge and kind of support our work in our classrooms. Her expertise and knowledge. Oh, tired. <laughs> I hear that. Um, yeah, so thank you all for being here. Um, and this concludes our evening this tonight. Um, stay in touch uh, on Facebook um, and uh, springboard meetings coming up pretty soon too. And YAM extension is uh, youth art month is February 28th. So there's lots of things going on. So tune in and partake. Also a big thanks to Josie for putting this all together. I, I uh, thank you. Very little. There's a lot of team support on this one. <laughs> yes. And an assist, but from Bob and Jody as well. Thank you all for, for asking me to join in and um, thank you to the artists as well for participating and everybody that joined. This was a fun night. So. Okay.